Welcome to Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And this episode is one of our new series of podcasts that investigates ethics and responsibility in the music industry. We're talking to Lewis Jamieson, Director of Communications at the Environmental Pressure Group Music Declares Emergency, which was founded in 2021. He's here to talk about the environmental changes that music fans expect from their favorite artists, festivals, gig venues and labels, and so on. Now, what is the Focus podcast? Well, Music Ally, as you know, provides an analysis-rich and contextual guide to the music business, and each of these Focus episodes analyzes one meaningful music business story at a time, and we do it as quickly as possible. This podcast should last about the same amount of time as it would take, yes, him again, our old friend Ashrita Furman, to hypothetically rotate a sword balanced on a dagger 300 times. He spun a sword balanced on a dagger 14 times in one minute in 2017. Now, talking of something teetering on the edge of disaster, Music Declares Emergency is an independent group that was formed a couple of years ago and says it believes in the power of music to promote the necessary cultural changes to create a greener, fairer, better future. You may be familiar with their No Music on a Dead Planet slogan that you'll have seen on posters and t-shirts and uh, on uh, social media. Lewis has been helping run Music Declares Emergency for three years and Music Declared Emergency recently partnered with University of Glasgow, the BPI and others to do research into the expectations of music fans and then how those fans might then pressure the industry to make a difference. We spoke to him about what it means and how the industry can respond. Okay, very happy to welcome uh, Lewis Jamieson of Music Declares Emergency to the podcast. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, f- for being here. Now, one little contextual question before we start. Do you have a favourite piece of music and what is that? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I, I was an A&R originally uh, and I've been doing this, well, I've been in the music industry for 30 years, so narrowing it down to one is almost impossible. I mean, at the moment, literally today, it's Bodies by the Sex Pistols. Um, that's because of the, the Danny Boyle biog biopic oh. rather that's on disney which has rekindled my love of um punk the attitude as much as the music uh and bodies the way that's contextualized i didn't know the story of how bodies came about i won't spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it but it's a really interesting story is how Lydon came to write those lyrics uh, and there's a, a, a piece in, in the, the series where they perform it live. And the way they've done it, it's not the pistols, it's the, the, the people playing the pistols performing it. But the way they've done it, it really captures the song beautifully and the energy of it and the kind of the visceral kind of nature of the track. And, and it's just it just really hit me when I was watching it. So I've, I've yeah. been listening to that a lot. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I'll put a link to that next to the podcast. And uh, what we're here to talk about is, I said, the, the expectation of fans with relation to the climate emergency and what they want f- and what they know. Now, this is important in the sense that, um, you know, we've been talking about the climate emergency for a while. You're obviously doing um, very important work in that space. And one of the, to, to contextualise this a little bit, there's a feeling in the last year or so, in particular, that the music industry wants to do something about the climate emergency. But... Mm. There's also some observers are saying, well, why don't you get on and do it then? <laughs> Which is a, an interesting tension. <laughs> um, and, and obviously, I'm yeah. acknowledging that many people are making very big steps. But one thing that will unequivocally drive change is if fans demand it and, and start mm. putting their money where their mouth is. So, yeah. first of all, can you tell us then about this? You, you partnered with the University of Glasgow, the BPI and some others on, yeah. a, on a comprehensive study of music fans' yeah. attitude yeah. towards climate action. Mm. what were the main takeaways yeah. and what did you well, learn yeah. it was it was their attitude towards it and their understanding of what's being done um and it came about just to give a little bit of context uh matt brennan who was the the lead researcher lead author on it um he is the guy who did um a, a piece of research on the live the uk live industry i think the paper was called uk live in 2018 so and he, he's been doing research in music for some time now um he's also written a couple of books um and and i was chatting to him because he was interested in sustainability in terms of music and culture uh, and i said you know what the, the the big there's two big missing pieces of research this this area doesn't have the research that other areas of music and social responsibility have you know in terms of diversity and in terms of gender pay gaps there's quite a lot out there in terms of 
climate attitudes. There's there's precious little. In fact, there's precious little to do with culture and climate in terms of academic research. So we felt it was a gap. Uh, and I said the, the, the conversation was essentially what we're missing is knowing what the fans think. There, there is quite a lot going on. I mean, the, the global labels, uh, the global majors and, and, and a huge amount of independence through Association of Independent Music, AIM and WIN, World Independent Network and Impala, the European independent organisation, all signed up to this thing called the Music Climate Pact the end of last year, which commits them all to the UN's race to zero. So there's a sustainability thing there and targets and goals. And Beggars Banquet have said they'll be carbon negative, I think, by 2030. Don't quote me on that, research it. I'm not 100% sure I've got the phrasing right. Ninja Tune, similarly. Uh, there's a lot going on in life. Um, but uh, we we didn't know, firstly, whether the audience cared, and secondly, whether the audience knew. So that, that was the, the basis of starting point for the research. And the logic behind that was that if we found that the audience did care, then there was a business case um, to the music industry for doing more and being more vocal about it. Uh, and, and also, if we could find out if they did care, we could find out what they did care about. So what things were more important to them than others? Uh, and ultimately, from a music declares goal, the, the, the end point logic of this, we exist to try and use music to encourage people to join the conversation. That's pretty much what we're here for. So any route that can get people interested in thinking about climate, sustainability, biodiversity, environmental protection, whatever, is good for us. What we found was quite interesting. So the, the headline takeaway was that music fans, self-identifying music fans, and if you want to read the paper, you will they will explain how we identified who a music fans do aren't from the random sample. Care more about the climate than the general public within the sample. You know, there's a 10, 12 percent difference. Um, when we dug a bit deeper, we then found that the more somebody identifies as a music fan, so people who uh, are music fans who not only buy physical product, but go to shows and buy merchandise, the more engaged they are with music, the more they care about this stuff. <laughs> Um, so the, the basic kind of business takeaway from that, I suppose, is that if you are a music company selling music in whatever form to people, the people you are selling to, the engaged music community, care about this stuff. So you have an open door to push. Um, what we also found, which was probably more interesting, almost was that despite that very few of these engaged music fans knew about the things that are already happening and we deliberately chose a, a range of um, suggestions to see if people had heard of them things that are happening and we, we we took we went from the most obvious ones we could think about to the more niche or the more the more new ones so for instance at the most obvious end of the spectrum we put in coach coach shuttles to festivals 30%, I think, we open that. We put in recyclable cup schemes, sub 30%, which I find somewhat bizarre. I mean, if you're a music fan and you've been to a festival, pretty much most festivals now, certainly even in the UK, have cup recycling schemes. Latitude have been running one for the best part of 10 years, as far as I remember. Uh, yet this people have obviously paid <laughs> for, for their recyclable cups, you know, for, for their, the cup that you keep and you give back and then you get your money back when you exchange it. It hasn't really somehow, they haven't registered what they're doing. Um, but the, the, um, I mean, the one that was really interesting from a, a kind of how media stories can push the story of sustainability in, in, in the music uh, sphere was we put in kinetic dance floors. And we put that in deliberately because Coldplay have been going on and on and on, not Coldplay, to be fair, I'm not sure Coldplay have been going on, but there have been a lot of coverage, shall we say, of Coldplay's kinetic dance floor on my current Music in the Sphere store, I think it's called, and, and how amazing it was that the audience jumped up and down and that created the electricity that went back into the show. 3%, 3% of our survey have heard of it. So, you know, we looked at that and we thought, well, that's really interesting because we, we've got an audience that, that are interested in in the concepts of sustainability, that they care about the climate, that they, they love music, but they want the music that they consume and they purchase and they watch to be created in a way that is less damaging and therefore doesn't contribute to the thing that they're concerned and, and, and worried about. And yet the things that are already being done are not translating to. Them. Thanks for that overview. I mean, there's a few interesting things there then, isn't there? And um, mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip lightly past the opportunity to uh, question 
how much uh, how much music Coldplay is going to perform that will get an audience dancing. Uh, but uh, that's that's just unfair, isn't it? They're doing yes, great it stuff. Is. It let's, is let's not be nasty to Coldplay. They, no, they no, I'm not going to be nasty to Coldplay. No. Um, but um, but the, the the really interesting thing there is that it, well, two things really, and it is that disconnect you sort of mentioned. Mm. I want to dig into that, which is that fans of music are more aware of. Um, the, the, what needs to be done for, to address the climate emergency, mm. and yet they're perhaps not of aware as aware of some of these things that are happening as we would have thought. Let's look mm. at the first part. Is there any indication of why music fans are more clued up? And is it because uh, of artists, for instance? Well, we don't know. Is the short answer. That's the next piece of research. We we, we want to dig into that, um, and the team that we work with at Glasgow are very keen to do that. So we're. We're hoping to find people who will fund them to do that that piece of work next. I mean, you know, you can you can put forward suppositions um, from experience of working in the music industry, and certainly, artist awareness raising is, is clearly. I, I don't. I think it would be very very hard to be a fan of, of certain acts and not um, take on board their values. So, for instance, if you are a fan of Massive Attack, I think it would be incredibly difficult to not be at least vaguely aware of climate issues, similarly Radiohead. Um, but that's to pick the two biggest examples. And Billie Eilish, who, uh, you know, her entire London run is themed around climate. There are two climate events there, one for fans, one for industry. The artist kind of um, exposition of their beliefs and their values and their morals is is undoubtedly going to translate somehow to to their audience. I mean, in a sense, that's why music declares exist. That was the logic we began with. You know, it, it sort of seems simple to say, well, you know, if like if the ten biggest artists in the world, if if Beyonce and Cardi B and whoever all united and said, hey, let you know, let do this to make a difference, that it would make a change. But it doesn't seem to work like that, does it? Well, and- yeah. I mean, the debate within climate circles is is should we be telling people that they individually have to solve it? Um, uh, and and to be honest, our declaration makes it quite clear where we believe that the, the, the show seems to come because we call on governments. Um, so uh, you know that, that's another that that's getting into the climate debate. But you know this is why you know for us in, in terms of how music relates to climate, we we feel that music can can start the conversation. I mean the the, the great quote that uh, somebody somebody gave to me. I um, can't remember the guy's name, but he invo- he, he organised those free Tibet gigs back in the the nineties with with the Beasties. That. he said yeah music doesn't change the world you know what it does though it brings together loads of people in the same space who share the same values and they work out how to do it uh and 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 that, I, that stayed with me um and i think i think that's really the dynamic that's most profitable in talking about this stuff uh rather than artists saying everybody recycle your bottles you know? yes but it, so the the artist could actually instead of communicating a simple message like that, which is perhaps not ineffective, but it could actually reframe the conversation to something that is more effective and people could be a little bit like how in recent years, for instance, fans of pop stars have gone from understanding nothing about uh, the ownership of master rights and, uh, but yeah. to, to Taylor Swift fans demanding that she owns her master recordings, which is uh, hard to, yeah. uh, hard to predict, uh, predicted, yeah. but it now yeah. is a thing that exists. Exactly. I mean, I think... I, I think, you know, in terms of, of what artists can do, and, and we'll bring this back to, to why it's important to, to fans and, and the industry to, to, to do this work in a minute. What artists can do is they can make people aware of the genuine situation. There's a huge amount of climate anxiety out there. Again, the surveys out there will tell you this. Um, and, and the best way to, to deal with anxiety is to give people purpose. Um, and I think artists can help in that with their fan bases and give people purpose. Um, but that... The reason we were interested in in, in, in focusing on fans um, was because we wanted firstly to see what ground those those messages could land on, but also secondly, we genuinely believe that the music industry has always been an innovative space for doing things differently, um, and we believe that the music industry's engagement, certainly the UK music industry's engagement with with sustainability, climate, biodiversity, and environment, has been markedly impressive in the last two years really we launched just before lockdown and it it was incredibly noticeable that as the lockdown went on and there was more engagement and more engagement from labels but also from promoters agents publishers um and now we're getting engagement from digital distributors as well uh all interested in how they can make their business model work in a more sustainable way and a a key part of this conversation from their side is making this 
a successful business model as well. It has to work as a business. But we again, we believe that there is a very uh, powerful argument that says change now is more effective and more cost effective than change later. And the, the other interesting bit of the survey that I didn't mention was that we found that music fans are prepared to pay more for products that are less harmful. So there is a, there is a business push there as well. There is a, you know, there's a, a profit motive, if you will, for looking at changing how you do things. You've mentioned Coldplay already, and obviously, you know, mm. they're, they're, they're doing this huge tour, which, you know, they, they very uh, openly and transparently took a step back and said, we're going we're gonna to organise this and do it in a way that we feel comfortable with, and that is right, and they're doing it, and they've, you know, they've unveiled this raft of um, sort of um, processes in place to, to help yeah. to, to try and deliver that. And they'll learn from it, and then in the you know in the future, uh, people will do even better versions of that. And so that's a quite an interesting thing to see from one of the biggest artists in the world. We yeah. often think about those kind of changes happening, sort of artists down, and and you've we've already sort of talked about that. But what about the other way, For fans first? I'm, I'm interested in in how fans could push change from the bottom of the pyramid. In terms of things that fans can do, um, I think the key thing that that we are co- consistently focusing on now because we do think it's the the obvious elephant in the room and the thing that needs to be fixed and also bizarrely the thing the music industry or the section of the music industry pertains to cannot fix is that the if you look at it in in purely carbon terms the biggest carbon emitter for any live show is the audience travel it's not the show it's not the band it's not the crew it's not the power it's the audience it's the audience getting there and coming out Now, there is a real problem here for anybody who lives outside major conurbations, and in the UK specifically, anybody who lives outside London. Because you talk to people in Leeds, Sheffield, Manchester, if you live in the suburbs of those big northern industrial cities, which most people do, very few people live in the centre of Manchester or the centre of Leeds. I know more do than used to, but the fact is most people live in Headingley or Batley or Pudsey or further on. You can't get back from the show on public transport at the end of the show. It's just not feasible. Uh, or, or if you can, it involves taking three buses and a circuitous route and takes you an hour and a half for what should be a 20 minute journey. Now, that's not something that the live music industry can fix, but it is something that the fan community can pressure those who have the power to fix it to fix if they work as a group you know in an ideal world we do this collectively across the country and fan groups would come together and we'd have lots and lots of voices but but even if you scale it down you could look at one place with a willing city council and you could look at the the bands coming in you could talk to the fan bases and say okay we're going to survey how you got back from the gig or we're going to survey how you plan to get back from the gig and how you want to get back from the gig and if how you plan to get back from the gig is different to how you want to get back from the gig. Let's see if we can find a pilot scheme to do the latter. And if that works, then we have a business case for changing how we get people to and from live events in city centres. In a strange way, the festivals have got a better system because they have the shuttle buses from train stations and so forth. So in a sense, there is already a model there that you could see how it could work. So that's one that, you know, that is essentially fans using their voice and demanding the things that they need. The, the beauty of, of, of our interconnected world now is, is that fans don't have to exist in real physical space. You know, when I was a teenager, I followed a couple of bands around for a bit. I don't, think, I don't know if anybody does that anymore. I mean, this was in the days when, you know, you had the Eskimos following the mission around and you had whatever new model army scary bunch of people were called and all the levelers of fans charging around after each other and all that stuff. Um, and, I, and I followed a family cat around. God knows to why I just had this thing about the family not? gathering. No show. judgment here. Yeah, I got to see PJ Harvey a load of times. She supported them on one of the tours. Um, and, and so you'd see the same people. Now, what happens now, obviously, in the modern world is, is you see the same people online all the time. So, And fan communities can come together and identify those shared values and use their voice to campaign against them through the music. So, you know, we saw this actually with the K-pop, uh, K-pop fans with what they did with Donald Trump 
where they all booked tickets for his his um, his rallies and obviously didn't turn up because he didn't live there. Now you know you may say, well, that's that you know that's that's terrible, depending on how you feel about that. Um, but but the the point behind it still stands is that collective action can make a political statement, can make a social statement. One of the most powerful things about solving this problem is people sharing experience and being aware of how the how it affects people in other places. You know, so we did a, a project uh, for Earth Day where we had the same different versions of the same song from all around the world. So we have videos from all around the world and seeing, you know, the global the videos from what's now called the global south, but from Africa and Southeast Asia and so forth. And, and, and being able to visually see how climate is already impacting on their on their environment is so much more powerful than reading about it secondhand. Individual actions are great examples to others to get on board. If you believe in what, you, what you're saying, then practice it as well, because by practicing it, you pass that on to somebody else who passes it on to somebody else. And we, you know, we, we get a more cohesive and a more powerful kind of movement behind us. And to jump in here, if you're finding this podcast useful and you want more of this kind of in-depth news and trusted analysis waiting for you in your email inbox every morning, as well as access to all of Music Ally's industry-leading reports and so on, head on over to musically.com slash subscribe. And don't forget, if you're an indie label, you're an artist manager, you're an employee of a CMO or a publisher, you, yes, you, might be eligible for one of our sponsored complimentary subscriptions as well. So head on over to musically.com slash subscribe to see if you can get it. Okay, let's go back to the podcast. One thing that we like to do on this podcast is trying to make it action oriented. We hear a lot from people in the industry that they're really excited to make change, but again even even at a sort of, you know, let's say slightly bigger level of, you know, you're not a fan, you're a, you're a label or something. It it can sometimes feel overwhelming as to getting started. What so we as you said, we've talked a lot about the the, the 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 obvious stuff to do you know um but what about those slightly less obvious things like how could a i don't know someone working in the music industry whether it could be a, a small label could be an artist management team mm. could be an artist mm. team how could they mm. nurture the fan community to help the fans then unify to do something impactful that helps in the, the climate emergency don't get me wrong. I think the UK music industry has taken great strides, but I, I think there's still a way to go. Um, I, I'd like to see merch um, taken a lot more seriously in terms of its impact. Um, I think there's a, a, you know, we produce T-shirts. They are produced in a circular, sustainable manner. The, their impact on the environment is massively, massively lower than an average piece of merchandise. We retail them at £20 a T-shirt. You know, that, that's not different to anybody else. Why is why isn't everybody doing that? You know that that would be the challenge I would put out to there there to anybody who is who is creating merchandise. Why are you not doing that? So the, there's a challenge. You know, um, you know the challenge there to fans is is nothing because it's still a t-shirt. It still retails at the same price, so they won't see the difference. Um, you know, I, I would say you know if you want to work with the fans, then. Um, generally either if as a label you want to make a statement then you know our research would suggest that you could go to the fans and you could say okay um we are releasing a record by x um we would like to do this in the most sustainable way possible that means that rather than it being on 180 gram we're going to do it on 140 gram uh, rather than it being shrink wrapped, it won't be shrink wrapped. We're not going to do a CD because dual cases are vile. Um, or we are going to do a CD, but they are, they're terrible. There's nothing. They're awful. Yeah, there's no redeeming. You features. can grind them up and turn them into roads. I mean, the irony there is huge. Um, you know, or we're going to do a CD. I mean, so a lot of this stuff, you know, labels like Ninja have been doing for years. Um, we're, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to do the CD in, in, you know, in, in paper packaging. I mean, the, the interesting thing, here's an interesting one. We didn't realize this until we started the music to class. The shrink wrapping of vinyl, or the shrink wrapping of all finished product. The reason behind that is because anything that gets a slight dink in it now gets returned and scrapped because it's considered damaged. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I know. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we, uh, another piece of research we want to do is to find out whether that is a, an audience response or uh, a, a retail response. 
um, we certainly know that there's there's a retail kind of a push in there. Um, we would we would like you know would like labels to especially labels that curate and, and create a lot of physical product that you know has that kind of creep diggery audience to have an honest conversation with them with their with their uh, with their audience and say you know are you, are you okay if it turns up and it's got a slight dink in it you know will you send it back because by sending it back we have to scrap it you know this is what it means so have an honest conversation you know stop vinyl in particular uh, being seen as this thing that has to be treated like it's dust, made of dust. made of gold dust yeah i mean mm. you know i've got tons of vinyl around there i was a dj at university all my favorite records are knackered literally you know some of them you pick it up and the record drops out yeah. because it's been you know i love that that they, they, they've got life in them i think we need to recalibrate you know the fetishism around finished product you know you know you know for me something something that that has character is more interesting than something that is perfect yeah. um you know everything in world collectible world i suppose we're in there you know so there's a conversation the merchandise conversation i mean if there are price points have an honest conversation with your fan base and say would you be willing to pay an extra couple of pounds because we want to do this t-shirt with you know we want to use recycled cotton that is more expensive and we want to use non-polluting ink and we want to do this and we want to do that and we don't want to ship it next day delivery will you wait a week for it so it can go on a slower mail process that isn't as carbon intensive to get it to you it's interesting you say that one of the things we hear a lot is and i mean, I think we said this at the start is an increased desire for transparency and that transparency with fans is surely is is powerful because if you say okay there are some collectors who will want the mint condition uh, vinyl and okay that's their that's their fetish right but a lot of people don't and you know it this it's almost like it's a bit of a dirty conversation to have. They don't dare have it in case it reveals some great truth. But actually, if you talk to fans and say, "Hey, would you pay more and wait a bit longer? And would you be, care if there's a wrinkle in the corner of your records?" They're probably going to go, "I just want a connection with my favorite artist, and I want that to be real, right?" Exactly. Exactly. I mean, the, the irony of the Ding record thing is there have been records, especially these days. You know, a new band comes out, and I think, "Oh, I quite like that." You know, I quite like that record, and it's gone. It's sold out in two minutes. Yeah. And I sit there thinking, I bet you at least a hundred of those two thousand will get scrapped. How annoying. I'd like a well, I'd like one of those hundred and I'll pay for it. <laughs> We're very clear that artists shouldn't get into this trap of thinking that every time they release a record or they go on tour, they're somehow doing something evil. That's their job. They're trapped in a system until and hopefully soon we will have a, a vinyl equivalent to bioplastic, which is in development by a company called Evolution Music. Fascinating thing that we're, we're working with them on. Um, so that will remove that problem. But, you know, touring, you, you know, you're in the UK, you've got to get to the States. What are you going to do? Swim? It's your job. You know, there's good travel and there's bad travel. So, you know, but they, they want to be seen to be active, some of these artists. And, you know, that they obviously go we could plant trees you know because that's what everybody knows you can plant trees and offset but there are other things you can rewild you but you could do something with your your audience where you could say okay well what we're going to do is we're going to release the record and uh for every record we sell we are going to partner with real wild rewilding britain or or with with a global kind of rewilding or nature preservation thing and for everyone we sell, we'll donate 50 pence or 50 euros or wherever, that you know. And you, as a, a fan, if you want to, can match fund that. And we will preserve whatever we preserve and we'll give it the album title. So as a fan, you can look on Google Maps and there's a little bit of somewhere that says, you know, the whatever the name of the album is, Forest, or whatever the name of the album is, Peat Bog, or whatever the name of the album is, you know, Nature Preserve, or whatever it may be, or Lake, or bit of seal so there's those kind of ideas coming on board those kind of creative ideas that 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 allow the creativity of the artist and and the kind of ability of the label to, to help them realize creative ideas to partner with fans to create something lasting that everybody feels like they have a share in which kind of replicates you know the album process you know we all feel like we have a part of our favorite album you know and when we go to the gigs we feel like we're part of the game and, and that fits in with the sort of modern way of working with fandom doesn't yeah. it and what fandom want is more yeah. than yeah. The, the, the transaction process yeah. they want to feel part of it they want to have some identity through it and if it means having you know 
visiting the Aphex Twin peat bog, yeah. which uh, sounds like a lot of fun to me. You know, that that would be something really good, wouldn't yeah. it? And and it, unifying yeah. around a common cause that, exactly. that makes fans feel good. Fans can be part of that process because what they can do is, you know, they can suggest to the artists through those channels that now exist and they can suggest to the labels through the channels that now exist. What, wouldn't it be great if... You know, wouldn't it be great if we did this? Or in the case of a lot of bands, I mean, you know, two that spring to mind, Idols and Yard Act, I, I randomly ended up on the fan groups both because I saw them quite early on. So somebody on Facebook went, oh, I'm starting a fan group. And I was like, yeah, all right, I'll join. I like the band. It'd be nice to know where they're playing and things like that. Those have grown to massive Facebook groups now. And they've started to do things outside of the band, social things, you know, like, you know, they raised some money for somebody who lost their job on the Idols one. And there was a support network going around for people who were struggling with COVID lockdowns and all this kind of stuff. So the power is there, definitely, for fans to come together and do things. And then, of course, when the band or the label or the management get wind of it, sometimes they go, that's a really good thing. We'll get involved. We'll bring the band's power to it. We'll bring the label's power to it. But that's actually that's actually quite clarifying, isn't it? Because it, it does say that if you, as a someone operating in the industry, is feeling a bit lost, actually, you're probably already building the um, infrastructure, yeah. the, the fan-to-artist connectivity, yeah. uh, c- community infrastructure. Yeah. And all you need to do, really, is, is, in, is be clear, be transparent, incentivize them to give you suggestions, explain what they would do yeah. to, to contribute to the uh, change in the climate emergency. And, and and then you make it part of the fan experience and, you, and you're away, which is, which yeah. is as you said, once you feel empowered, yeah. you feel like you're doing something. Yeah, I mean, and anybody who's listening to this who does work in the music industry, I mean, I don't think you need to be like, you know, executive director, chief of marketing to, to be effective here. You know, we, we have what we loosely term our working group, which is an ever not ever changing, but an ever developing cast of people who work in the music industry who come along and say, I'd like to help. And we go, great, you know, (laughs) join the group. And if you can help, you know, there's always a million things we're trying to do. And if you see one you can help with, do it for us or help us do it. Or, you know, whether it's connect us to this person or that person, or does anybody know how we do this? Or So there's always, you know, an opportunity for for people with you know skill sets and imagination and drive to to be part of this to be part of it with us or to be part of it within their own label yeah well i will put some links uh, around the podcast for the listeners um first of all to get get in touch with you if they want to get involved but also to the the research you spoke about and uh link to the uh there is um there's a free download uh available on our website of a thing we did called the music climate pack Mm-hmm. It was done for our, our conference we did we did in London uh, last year. Uh, and that has a page for pretty much everybody we can think of is involved in the music industry, including fans, of suggestions and links and ideas. So it goes all the way through labels, artists, fans, managers, promoters, etc., merchandise. Um, so it's a good starting point if you kind of listen to this and you go, oh, well, I work in this. I wonder what I could do. Start there if you're interested get in touch with us or talk to people at your business or your other band members or whatever it is and go from that really great well i'll link to that and um well let's get thank people uh, get people started hey so yeah thank you uh lewis uh, from music declares emergency thanks for joining us it's a pleasure thanks very much so if you found that useful please share this podcast on with someone else who you think will get something out of it and if you'd like to continue the conversation with me please do email me uh, it's joe at musically.com that's joe j-o-e at musically.com if you would like to stay in touch with music ally we have a free weekly email called the knowledge which arrives in your inbox every friday with a wet thump and rounds up a soup son of the best analysis news marketing insight and skills all pulled from music allies wider service so sign up and impress your boss links are in the description along with everything we mentioned in the podcast as always well, that's it. Uh, thank you ever so much, as always, for joining us here on the Music Ally Focus podcast. And from me, Joe Sparrow, Music Ally's editor, farewell. 